and and how we can facilitate the uh, interactions between industry and academia. I would like to uh, talk about that in my presentation. So I'll just start with sharing my slides. There we go. So I hope my slides, uh, slides are visible. Yes. Yes, so, so great. Uh, so as uh, Ashish Haji mentioned that the, uh, the title of my talk is uh, we want to bridge the gap between industry and academia to accelerate the development of whatever technologies we are working on at, in IIT Kanpur and what are the strategies we are doing, adopting to tackle this uh, problem, to tackle this challenge. Uh, so I'll not go uh, uh, with my introduction since that has already been given. Uh, so I'll just talk about my background, right? Since that is very important uh, to understand where I'm coming from, uh, right? So uh, I have uh, my academic background is I've under I've done undergraduate in material science, uh, and I've done postgraduate in electrical engineering. So I have knowledge of uh, material science and somewhat knowledge of electrical engineering. So that helps me out in working on device related projects or device related research. And then uh, from academia after doing my PhD, I went to work in industry for nine years at Intel and where I was an R&D scientist, research and development scientist to begin with. I have it was not only plain R&D, plain research and development. We were also involved. I was also involved in working on automation. Automation, which was one of the key aspects since everything, all the wafer processing, every single process that was done at Intel was all automated. There was no human intervention at all. Uh, everything was uh, done using robotics. They were uh, robot arms that were handling the wafers uh, to program those robot arms. It was us who were doing most of the programming and scaling up of the process, right? Since, since these wafers, these uh, processors that we use in our uh, our desktops or in our laptops. These processors they are not even they are not made at the scale of thousands of processors. They are made at the scale of millions, right? So to wrap up from let's say tens of processors to millions of processors, that scale up is very uh, critical. We want to make sure the transfer of technology is happening seamlessly from the lab to the manufacturing sites. Right, so scale up. I was involved in scale up also. So I've done a lot of. Uh, I've seen different aspects of industry while I was at Intel. It was not just research and development. It was these three key key aspects also: automation, robotics, and scale up. And these three aspects are very important uh, in dealing with industry, dealing with industry projects, uh, because these let you know that what are the kind of problems that industry is dealing with. So I'll share key things about my industry experience, what I've learned there, what are the skill sets that I've acquired over the time period of nine years or so. Uh, so I was mainly involved with Intel. And then, as I mentioned that everything was automated, the wafers were processed from one equipment to another equipment in an automated manner. There was no, no one was hand carrying the wafers. Right, because these wafers, I will show you a picture of wafer. Right, these wafers, each wafer would be of millions of dollars. Right, so if something happens to the wafer, if someone drops a wafer, then the company will suffer a million dollar loss, which is huge. Right, so so everything was auto, even the processes were automated. The way where the way these wafers were handled was also done using robotics. So they just to remove the margin of error. Right, there should not be error. There should not be any human error in handling these processes. I did a lot of process development. I was mainly involved with filling these small, these are nanometer scale uh, vias and trenches, right? These are nanometer scale uh, patterns, which nanometer is like one micron is one tenth of the thickness of human hair. So you can imagine thousand times smaller than a human hair. 
that would be the kind of dimensions that we are working on at Intel. So thousand times smaller than the width of human hair, right? So and our job was to fill these features. So it was not at all a trivial process. It was very complicated. It was involving these million dollar equipment, like tens or fifty million dollar equipment were used to execute this process. This is the wafer around 12 inch in diameter that we are working on. This wafer used to go from one chamber. It is showing this. This image here is showing the schematic of the wafer. So wafer is basically going from one chamber to another chamber, getting all sorts of processing. Everything is done using robotics. There's a wafer handling arm which takes the wafer from one chamber to another chamber to another chamber, and the wafer gets sequential processing. So I got to learn about robotics. I got to learn about a lot of automation systems that were in place to make sure the processing is done in an automated manner without any hiccups, without any problems. And then it was just not research and development. There cannot be research and development without fixing the equipment, right? Uh, it cannot be that the that the equipment is running without any issues, right? Equipment will break down. You'll have to uh, uh, wear a uh, wear a mechanics hat and fix the go and fix the equipment, right? So that all we have we had to do we had to do a lot of troubleshooting of equipment, what went wrong, what had to be done to fix it, and also when once we go from one technology to another technology, the equipment had to be upgraded. The same equipment cannot be used for let's say a process which is uh, 10 years, the, the process which is 10 years old, we have, we have been using an equipment, but then that same equipment cannot be used to handle a process which is much more complicated. So equipment had to be upgraded every technology. So equipment upgradation is another skill set that, that I will explain how is it going to help me out in my academia research. So the skill sets that I required while working at Intel was, I used to work in teams which was very diverse. Right, uh, the, these team members, some of the team members were integration engineers, some of the team members were yield engineers. They had no idea of what the process, what was going inside the process, what exactly we were doing to uh, to deposit the layers that we were depositing. They they had very little cue of the processing details uh, that we were working on. So we had to brief them, we had to give them some training, we had to talk, we had to discuss them, discuss the details of the process with them, give them knowledge so that they can work together with us in, in a team, in a seamless team and, and help us address some of the issues that Intel was facing, right? So work, worked in different kind of teams. Other thing was that, as I mentioned that, we had to constantly upgrade the equipment because the same equipment could not uh, cannot uh, deliver the kind of processes that we needed for the next technology. So we had to constantly upgrade the hardware and processes. With that, we were working on several vendors. With, with that, we were working on working with several vendors like Applied Materials, LAM Research. So there was a constant communication between Intel team and the team of the vendors. And we, I was the one, we, we were giving them specifications what kind of tool set we require, what are our process requirements, and based on based on that requirement, they were giving us their suggestion on what kind of equipment will work out best for us. And then it was our job to try those equipment, do those upgrades, and see whether it fixes the problems that we are dealing with, whether it is suitable for the process or not. So again, clear and concise communication, right? You need to be able to give what specification, what are your requirements, and accordingly so that your vendor understands what the problem is and they can help fix it. So another thing, another skill set that I acquired when I was in industry was uh, we were we were started out with a like a small set of wafers, right? That we were using for the next set of next technology. Right. We were doing developing a process. Uh, for the next technology, we were only doing that for let's say tens of or tens of wafers or hundreds of wafers, right? And then once we made sure that those hundred wafers have given the performance that we need, then we were scaling it up. Then we were scaling up the process to thousands of wafers, then millions of wafers, right? So it was a step by scale up process, going from tens to hundreds of wafers to thousands of wafers to millions of wafers, right? But 
the pro the 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 biggest mistake we can do here is uh, that the technology transfer has to be copied exactly right whatever we are doing whatever process we are doing on the tens of wafers or hundreds of wafers that should be exactly replicated to thousands of wafers and millions of wafers if we miss a small step if we miss a tiny detail the entire process when we take it up to millions of wafers will not be replicated our output will be suffer our output will suffer our yields will go down so copy exactly is something that we followed right copy the tiny tiniest of the details and then scale up the process and then uh, since we were de constantly developing technology uh, and then i was made owner of let's say 10 nanometer technology and then my job was to own the technology from the very beginning to the end so whatever are the issues from the beginning to the end i was the responsible I, I was the person who was responsible for that so that means that if there's any hiccup if there's any uh, yield issue i am the person responsible so it is kind of a product development right when you when you start your own company you you starting from scratch and then you're building on top of it and then you take it to the finish line that's what i was doing in the industry right so this experience the four things that i talked about is the uh, the skill sets that i uh, that that i acquired these are the things that are enabling me to work closely with industry when i'm in academia right now and then again this uh, just minimize this so i've used to i used to i've used a lot of softwares to analyze data right we used to work with a lot of data to look at how the what what kind of performance we are getting from these wafers what is how the process changes the performance right and we are doing all these correlations so i required a lot of software skills also uh, so a lot of statistical skills i used to use a, a lot of statistical uh, statistical softwares like spc jump data analytics software so i have acquired a lot of software skills also some some modeling background i had from the research that i have done at iit kanpur so so that was all the industry experience i have gained over the 8 9 years now uh, i talk like uh, very briefly about the research that we are doing at iit kanpur in my group uh, so as you can see here so right, this block diagram is divided into three parts right there's energy generation which is mostly solar photovoltaics so this is something that i had done in my phd uh, so this is basically my bread and butter butter i am very comfortable with doing research in solar photovoltaics right so when i joined iit kanpur in 2019 i realized that i should go with my uh, basics i should go back to my roots i should start with something that i am familiar with right and something that i'm familiar with is is solar photovoltaics solar cell research and i should start with solar cell research so that's where i started with solar photovoltaics back in 2019 when i joined iit kanpur but then i realized that let i mean even if you have solar cells these solar cells work during the day time and in night time you don't get any light you don't get sunlight so you don't get any power out of solar cells then what do you do during night time how do you generate power how do you generate electricity let's say you want to go completely green right then the only option is that you have to use batteries right and so you what you do during day time is you produce excess power from solar cells and you store all of that excess power in batteries right so that excess power that you have stored in batteries that you can do use during the night time to run your appliances then i realized that okay that maybe battery is a very critical area and then i saw that in batteries there were a lot of opportunities because you look at electric vehicles the cost of tata nexon is around 15 lakhs right cost of a regular vehicle is around 10 lakhs regular suv is around 10 lakhs cost of electric vehicle based suv is 15 lakhs so you have to pay extra rupees 5 lakhs which is the premium for your uh, battery pack or premium to take it from diesel or petrol to electric uh, vehicle based so 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 this additional cost is there because the most of this cost is coming from the battery pack that is installed in this electric vehicles so the battery pack which is installed in electric vehicles is increasing the price of the electric vehicles so then i realized that even if you use existing technologies like lithium ion batteries 
then also the cost of these batteries is very high, which is increasing the cost of the vehicle. And even for grid storage, what I'm what I mean by grid storage is basically whatever you generate from your solar, you have to store it in a battery so that you can use it during the night's time. That storage that you make to store the excess electricity that is produced by solar panels, that is called grid storage. So even for grid storage, there is no technology which is cheap, right? The technologies that are available out there is lithium ion batteries, which are very expensive, which are not meant for grid storage because then your grid storage price will be very high. And then you have lead acid batteries, which have very low energy density. You'll need a lot of lead acid batteries to save, to store the same amount of electricity. So the technology is not there, right? So you have to, so then I realized that there's a lot of scope of research in energy storage. And I, this is a huge opening for me. And I should, this is something which I would like to diversify on. And I, I should switch from solar cell to batteries, or I should expand from solar cell into batteries. Right. So that's that's the reason I jumped into the area of energy storage and batteries. And it was not trivial at all. I had to do a lot of learning. It was not I I I did not learn electrochemistry while doing PhD. I had to learn electrochemistry. I had to listen to a lot of podcasts. Okay, the reason I'm saying highlighting this is because podcasts are very essential uh, while while jogging, while running, while walking during the evening, right? I instead of listening to music, I used to listen to podcasts, which were all related to batteries. So they used to talk in a layman way, right? Not very technical, but in a layman manner, they used to talk about uh, what are the current battery technologies, what are the problems associated with these batteries, uh, what is the next, what is the future technology, right? So that gave me some background. So once I had that background, once I had some technical background, then I can go ahead and read more technical papers. So to in order to build that background, I realized that listening to podcast was the easiest way to enter into a field. And then once I had that initial background, then I could easily go and read papers, dive much deeper into the area. So, so that's the reason why I choose this energy storage and batteries. I thought I should give that. And then the CMOS and interconnect fabrication, this is the area that I was working on at Intel. Uh, I have eight years of research and development experience at Intel in this area. So, and then there are two, and then Indian government is also deciding to start up two uh, uh, fabs in India, uh, which which are going to be uh, on based on which are going to uh, do silicon fabrication right from the uh, right from the wafer fabrication all the way to processor fabrication. So, so that kind of fabs are being set up in India. And Indian government is in investing around rupees seventy thousand crore into this in these projects. So, so that is again an opportunity which I see of of doing research. Uh, it is not there, but once these fabs are set up, then then we can take up some problems or take up some challenges that are being faced by these industries, the fabs that are being set up, and we can tackle those help tackle those problems. Okay, so these these are the themes that my uh, lab is currently working on. So let's talk about this industry academia gap, right? Which is the uh, main uh, uh, theme of this overall talk, right? Why industry and academia are so different, right? And why they have different objectives. So I'll talk about industry, right? And then I'll give you examples of what is going on in academia. So in, the, in, in industry, what I've seen is that it's all industry is always operating in survival mode. Right. Uh, it is always like uh, you're looking for the next deadline. You're looking to meet the next deadline, need, looking to meet the next target, next objective. Whereas in academia, there are no hard and fast deadlines. Right. You are just working to meet the expectations. And these expectations are your own. Right. You, you have expect you have expectations from yourself. You have expectations from your peers that I should be publishing these many papers. Uh, I should be uh, writing these many proposals, I sh and no one is forcing you to do those things, right? As long as you meet the minimum number of papers, as long as you uh, publish minimum number of papers, you should be good. Or as long as you have some funding so that you're able to do some research, that should be good, right? But these are expectations that are uh, set by us only. Uh, in industry, you work on, you work towards short-term goals and targets, right? 
that you want to fix the yield problem. You want to increase the output by, let's say, 10%. You want to address some issue that you saw in the wafer and you want to address that issue or you want to say, fix some process related issue. Right? These are all short term targets, short term goals. In academia, when you, when you look at academia, you look at long term career goals. Most of the faculty, I mean, even I am looking at long term career goals, right? That I should have more papers, I should have more publications, I should have more uh, proposals, I should be writing more patents, uh, I should buy this equipment so that I can do this research, right? All of those things. These are all long term career goals. Uh, industry, when I look at uh, what kind of technology, what kind of solutions industry adopts, it's mostly proven technology. Right. When I talk to vendors, when I talk to vendors about what kind of equipment they can supply, they have already tested that equipment for the process. Right. When I buy a certain equipment from a vendor, when I'm in industry, then they have already done all the testing and they are selling me the equipment. Right. So they have already tested the solution. So these are already low risk solutions and these are already proven solutions. Right. Because industry does not have a margin to take risk. Right. If industry starts taking risk, then the reputation of the industry will will suffer, right? Because if they are not able to meet the deadlines, if they are not able to deliver the product on time, if they are not able to meet certain targets, certain objectives, then the reputation of the industry will go down the drain, right? So that's that's something that industry wants to avoid. Whereas in academia, we are, we can take high risk, uh, we can go for high risk solutions. Uh, should I mean it? It can work out. It may not work out. Uh, so it's it's not a hard and fast thing, right? So so high risk solutions solutions are viable in academia, whereas not these high risk solutions will not work in industry. Most of the focus of uh, industry research, or most of the focus of industry is cutting the cost and improving the profit margins. Right? Then only they will be able to pay the salary of the employees. Then only they will be able to uh, expand. Then only they will be able to grow. Right? Then, o then only the stock price of the industry will go up. So they are mostly concerned about cost cutting and profit margins. Whereas academia, we are mostly focused on research and teaching gains. Uh, we want to get as many awards as, uh, as possible. We want to publish as many papers. We want to have more citations for our work. Right? Citations is a big deal. And then we want to write. We want to write more grants, we want to have more funding, right? These are all, uh, so these are, this is the focus that we mostly see in academia. Uh, so focus of industry is mostly yield related and not much on innovation. They want to do limited in innovation so that they can go from one technology to another technology, but while doing that, they don't want to take too much risk. So it's mostly on yield improvement. Whereas academia, they'd like to focus more on innovation because the more you innovate, you'll be able to publish in nature and science. Right? If you have less innovation, you will not be able to publish in nature and science. So high risk, high innovation ideas, that's what we want we we'll like to work on. And that's why that's that's how we can publish in high impact factor journals. So uh, I'll talk about a few of the uh, stereotypes that uh, all of the industry people think about us, and I used to also think about like this only. Uh, but then when I entered academia, my outlook changed. But this is the typical academia stereotype that is out there. Uh, some of things things are not true at all, but this is what I've seen in being in the industry. This is how people see academicians as. So what uh, people in the industry believe that most of the academicians, they are unorganized, they do not. Uh, they do not like to. I mean, they do not stick to the deadlines. They do not meet deadlines, and uh, the research that most of the people, most of the academicians do, is mostly theoretical in nature, and it has very little, very little practical application. Okay, so that's the stereotype that is out there. That is, these are the myths that are out there. Okay, and the other thing, the major. Uh, Biggest stereotype is that the the I mean the academicians they don't understand what the challenge is, what are the challenges that industry is facing, what are the industry problems, and how to solve those problems. And then another stereotype is that uh, 
academicians, they don't know how to sell their skill set. They don't know how to sell their products. They don't know how to sell their research. They lack marketing skills. Right. But all of this is changing, right? All of this is changing. Uh, these are stereotypes they were built, but uh, now the picture is changing. So at IIT Kanpur, we can see this changing. We have SIDPI, we have startup into uh, six startup in incubation and innovation center, which is housing uh, a lot of startups, uh, not only from our own students, but it is also incubating companies ideas which are from outside the uh, campus also outside the university also. So, so a lot of startups are being incubated at SIDP. We have Techno Park that is facilitating the interaction between industry and academia. A lot of industries can, can find space in Techno Park. We have a new building coming up for Techno Park. Right? A lot of companies can be can can find some space there. They can actively work with academicians in solving industry related problems. That is what we need. And then secondly, is also interacting with a lot of industry. They are taking a lot more industry projects because these are challenging problems. These are real life problems. And as academicians, we just we don't want to do publish for the sake of publishing only. We want to see some real life application of our research. So. So I've talked about what are the gaps between industry academia, and then I'll just briefly discuss uh, the projects that I am working on that are industry related, and what kind of uh, I'll, how how I procured those projects, what were the challenges uh, that we associated with those industry related projects. So these are the two projects basically that are from industry. This is uh, one from Gujarat Fluorochemical. And the other one is from off grid energy labs. Uh, and there, there's one more project which I've not shown here, uh, which is from industry. So these two projects mostly involve batteries, testing of batteries, doing failure analysis, why the batteries are failing early, finding the root cause, uh, do detailed characterization, detailed testing of batteries. So uh, so I would like to give a brief outline of what are the steps that I followed uh, when I uh, had interaction with industry. Right? How did I secure these projects? What are the steps I executed? What are the steps I took to 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 make sure these projects are run smoothly? Right? So all of that will be covered here. So what I started out with is what are the kind of problems I'm willing to take? Right? I cannot deal with all the problems that are out there, right? I have to narrow down. So these are the problems that I targeted. That this is the area. These are the areas that I feel comfortable working on, and these are the challenges that I would like to take upon. So the three areas that I decided were battery material testing, right? We can do a lot of material testing for for companies that are making these battery materials. Also, we have companies uh, like Vikram Solar, Avada Solar. Right, all these companies they are making their own PV modules, PV panels, and they would like to see stability testing or how long these modules can last in the field, how long these solar panels can last in the field. So they they would like to have some stability testing data of these modules. So this is one of the problems that I would like to work on. So this is one thing that I targeted, and then the other thing is since my group works on perovskite solar cells. I would like to improve the stability of perovskite solar cells and find any company which is interested in, in fixing this problem, the stability problem of perovskite solar cells. So find a company which is uh, uh, which is also struggling with this issue and would like to see a solution of this problem. So the next thing I did was I prepared the prepared a team, right? And for the I mean team part is not. Uh, trivial at all. It is very critical to a successful execution of a project. So you have to have a right team with right mindset who can deliver, who can do the testing, who can deliver the output within that certain time limit, so that certain time window. So I'll just uh, exit out and I'll go to the sl next slide, which talks about team building. So I had two big teams that I built, right? One was the battery team which were working on battery related projects from industry. The other team was working on 
which was the solar team, which was working on solar photovoltaics related projects, industry projects, right? So these are my students. Some of these are postdoc students. Some of these are, these are PhD students who were working on these problems. And so how did I form these teams? So I formed these teams related to the research, right? So if the student is working on battery related research, then he can help me out with the industry project that is going on on the battery related problems, right? So based on the research areas, I, I formed these teams. Then the other thing was, uh, these students had to be trained in in the fabrication of batteries, in the testing of batteries. Same thing for the solar team also. They had to be trained on fabrication and testing of solar panels. So they had to undergo a lot of training to, to get to the stage where they can help me out with the execution of these industry projects. And then we had to have a contingency plan because none of these students are there for forever. Right. I don't I don't want to keep a PhD student for let's say 10 years. I want to graduate. I want to make sure they graduate on time. So I had to have a contingency plan. Let's say if a master student has graduated, then he should be transferring his skill set to a new master student. He should be training a new master student. He should be training, transferring his knowledge to another PhD or master student so that the project work can continue. So that contingency plan is always there. Right, so that the progress of the industry project does not stop. Then we come to the innovation aspect, right? Because most of these industry projects, like some of these projects will only involve testing of battery. Now, most of the students say, right, what I'm a PhD student. Why am I only doing testing? What am I learning from this? There's no innovation in this project. This is all something we'll gather. We are gathering data and we are sending it to industry. What is what is there in learning? This is not research. So then I had to include some innovation aspect in these projects. Like uh, we we went back, we took a step back. Some of these batteries were failing early in life. Then we had to take a step back and see why, what is the reason why these batteries were failing, right? And then there is, there is where the research component came, finding the failure mechanism. And then we did a lot of material testing, which was not the objective of the industry, right? Industry just wanted us to test the batteries, but we for, for our own innovation, for our own learning part, for our own research, we did the material testing to figure out why the batteries were failing. So that so I had to keep some innovation aspect in all these industry projects so that the students stay motivated, so that students are involved in the research, so that students are learning something new from these projects. And then uh, the students had to be compensated, right? You cannot take as much work from the students and not compensate them. That is, you don't want to be treating them as labor laborers, right? They are, uh, they, these are students, right? So they have to be treated appropriately. And if, let's say if they're working for like one or two months uh, on, on a certain project and they, wa they want some time off, they want some compensation, then I should be willing to let them go. I should be willing to take time off. I should be willing to uh, give them some break. They can go there, go to their hometowns. And then again, if if a project is funded, there's some money, some money for manpower, then I can give some additional funding towards their, uh, apart from their PhD or master's scholarship. So that kind of compensation should also be there in the industry project. So prepare the team, right? So reach out to then, once the, I, I had the team prepared, then we re reached out to several industries. And uh, how, how did we de do this reaching out? We, the Technopark sends out emails that this industry is interested in work, working on this problem. So that is one way of reaching out to industries. There are also conferences. You can go to several conferences. There are industry representatives also there. And if they are working on similar area, you can go and talk to them. You can figure out what are the problems they are struggling with. And you can propose your solutions. You can propose what all facilities you have so that you can do the same research in your lab in a more detailed manner. And you can figure out solutions for them. right? And then you can also schedule some industry visits. This is something I like to do. right? Whenever I'm going to, let's say, Gujarat or Delhi, I plan my visit accordingly so that I visit to one or two industries. And then I'd like to talk to the people there and see what are the problems they are facing day to day. Even it could be a very small problem. It could be a major problem that is 
plaguing their output. So you can discuss all of those details when you visit our industry. Uh, again, you should be showcasing your strength, right? How do you showcase your strength? What what strengths do you have as a researcher? Right? You have some proven expertise that you can display uh, from your publications, right? Whatever publications you have in the research area that you're working on, that is kind of your proven expertise. So you should be selling your strengths when you go and talk to your talk to these industries that have published papers on these. I have proven expertise in this area. I have done these projects in the lab. So this all you should be able to uh, show using your uh, publications. And then also another strength that you have is the facilities. Over the time you have built some facilities in the lab, uh, some synthesis facilities, material synthesis facilities, material uh, device fabrication facilities, some testing facilities, some characterization facilities. So you should be able to show all these, you should be able to tell all these facilities and how you are positioned appropriately to solve these problems by using all these facilities and by using the knowledge that you have gained over the time by working on research problems, right? So and then after all of that, once you showcase, once you meet the industry people, once you showcase your, so before, so I, I just like to show you some uh, slides that I've shown to the industry people based on like, so something like this, you can make a slide with all the papers that you have in the relevant area. So I, what I've done is in the past is I've shown them that I have these many publications in the area of solar cells, and these are these are dealt with these these specific problems. So I have proven expertise in this area, right? And I have a patent also on solar cells. So this is something you can use uh, in in convincing the industry that you have expertise in this area. And uh, the other thing is other strength I've talked about is facilities. So facilities again, you can we can we can make a slide like this where you talk about all the solar cell facilities that you have in your research lab, be it material synthesis, device fabrication, device characterization, device testing. Same thing you can do for battery research. I mean, in my case, it was battery research. All the facilities that I have to make coin cells, to make pouch cells, to do the testing of coin cells and pouch cells. So you can showcase all these facilities to let the industry know that. We can do this work. You you can be assured of this that we can we can we can do this research. We can tackle this problem. We can uh, find a solution for your problem. We are not lacking any facility. And once that part is out of the way, then you have to meet with the industry personnel, right? And then try to understand what problems they are dealing with. What is the problem exactly, right? And it should not be like other way. It should not that you you are trying to sell them what you have right this problem this point is very critical this is a basic marketing skill you should not be selling what you have but you should be selling what they want right what the industry wants what is exactly their problem you should be trying to solve that instead of posing your own problem posing your own solution you should be trying to solve the problem that industry is facing what exactly industry is looking for that is the key thing and you should be trying to solve the problem within that expected timeline. So timeline is very critical. Industry is very uh, tight about the timeline. Uh, so timelines are very crucial, very critical when we talk about industry deliverables, industry projects. Uh, you cannot delay your projects. You cannot delay the deliverables of the project when you're dealing with industry. Like most of the government projects, you can extend them by a few months. You can extend them by six months, but not for industry projects. right? They give you some funding to tackle a problem because they have a product coming out. And if you do not uh, solve the problem within that certain, within that uh, given timeline, then the product delivery, their product coming out to the market will be delayed. And then the industry is going to suffer losses. Industry is not willing to take such risk. And that's why, so that it is better to have that understanding initially when you talk to the industry about timelines. And then once you understand what are the industry problems, what are the timelines, what is the budget requirement, then you can draft a proposal. You can request for a realistic budget and you can discuss all these details with the industry to finalize the proposal, right? So this proposal writing part is very critical. All the relevant details should be in the proposal. And then you can start project execution, right? 
once you start, once you are at this stage, you are working on the project and you are giving regular updates to the industry, right? If you have a certain delay, you should let the industry know. If your equipment malfunctioned and you're trying to fix that equipment, and because of that, you're not able to make progress, you should be very honest with the industry, right? You should give them heads up. This this should not be you should not be saying that towards towards saying this towards the end of the project. See, I, I had my equipment malfunctioning in the beginning of the projects. That's why the project got delayed by three or four months. You should be giving regular updates to the industry. That is very important. You should be honest to the industry. You should not be lying to the industry. You should not be uh, right. So it should be very it should be a very transparent process. Uh, so I'll give some tips. I mean, these are not tips or these are just something that I would like to follow when I'm writing a proposal for industry. Uh, so timelines. So all the milestones, all the deliverables. By deliverables, I mean what kind of product you're going to deliver, what are the objectives you're trying to meet, what are the things that I, you're trying to address, what are the solutions you're trying to come up with. All those milestones, all those deliverables have to be timed. They have to be having, they need to have a timeline. Right, so all the deliverables have to have a timeline. And then uh, also in the proposal, you should mention a methodology. What methodology means is how you're going to go about tackling that problem? How are you going to come up with the solution of that problem? What are the what are the methods? What are the techniques you are going to use to solve solve a problem? And then finally, deliverables. Like what are the objectives of the project? Okay, how are you going to pull? What are what are you going to do in the project? What exactly are the objectives? And these are all quantitative objectives. Like in this case, you can see when I talked about uh, testing a battery. Or, or 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 coming coming up with new kind of battery, right? I gave these quantitative deliverables, right? That the capacity of the battery should be more than this. The life, the cyclability of the battery should be thousand cycles. The size of the capacity of the battery should be greater than one ampere. That means these are all quantized. Okay, these are not. I'm not throwing. I'm not throwing arbitrary numbers. I'm not throwing any qualitative deliverables. These are all quantized. These are all quantitative deliverables, right? So, so industry would like to have some numbers. Industry would like to see some numbers that once you execute the project, what kind of deliverables you are going to give, what kind of quantitative outputs you're going to give, right? What will be the capacity? What will be the lifetime of the product? How are you going to improve the lifetime? So all those details should be there in the deliverables. And uh, so just budget should be realistic, okay? If, if industry knows the ins and outs of the process, industry knows how much it is going to build a product, how much is it, how much it, it is going to cost to build a battery, how much realistically it is going to cost to test a battery, how, what are the product, what, what is the cost of certain equipment? Industry has this background, right? They have done their homework. So if you, if you give a budget and you unrealistically, are, are you giving unrealistic, uh, charges you're getting unrealistic prices of the equipment prices of the uh, of the of the materials then they will figure it out and then that's where you lose your trust right so give realistic budget and include consumables what are the material costs that is going to be involved in executing the in, in executing that project uh, you can do since your time is also involved in working in this problem you are you are Taking time out of your other product, other projects, your time taking time out of your teaching and everything. So you can charge for some basic consultancy also. Manpower, if you are recruiting a dedicated manpower to work on the project, you can put some money aside for manpower. You should not be uh, buying a major equipment from industry. Project. Industry believes that you already have all the resources that you would like, that you, you would that you would want to work on the problem, right? The industry assumes that you already have everything, you are self-sufficient, you have everything in the lab that you need to work on the problem. So minor equipment you can request from the budget or from the proposal or from the from the project, but not anything major. Taxes will be there, 18% GST you have to include, and then uh, there will be some overhead that will go to, to the institute. So I will give some basic examples of what industry projects I dealt with and how I how, how I dealt with those industry projects, how I 
funded those industry projects to give some idea, some flavor of this to this talk. So uh, one of the projects was from Gujarat Low Carbon Limited. Uh, this was basically on testing of battery materials. So I, I'm showing I'm showing you the other way around, right? Uh, so we did failure analysis. We did post mortem of the batteries while the batteries were failing, right? We also did performance testing of the batteries, right? Uh, at what how how long it took for the batteries to fail? So you can see we did some material testing for these uh, for the the industry. They gave us three kinds of materials, and we tested the performance of all three materials and figured out which material was better, which material was worse. And they gave us some commercial, commercially available material also, which they were trying to compete with. So we are testing a commercial, commercially available material and the material that industry was making on their own, and the industry was interested in commercializing the material that they were trying to manufacture. So, so we compared the industry manufactured material with the commercially available material and then we did the performance testing we did the failure analysis so we realized that uh, the industry the, the industry this gfl was making a material which was subpar to the commercially available material its performance was very bad com compared to the commercially available material and then we did so we then we uh, did some uh, uh, root cause analysis that why is the material worse what is going on? Why is the battery having early failure when we are using the GFL material, not the commercially available material? So we did some materials characterization and we correlated it with the material properties that the material had low viscosity because of some inherent crystallinity of the material. Because of the crystallinity of the material, the material solution had low viscosity because of that it was having early failure. So all of that material characterization, this was not expected from us. Industry did not expect this from us that we'll come up with the root cause. But again, to make the project interesting for the students, right? To have some research component in the project to 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 figure out the root cause, we did this on our own. And the student also got interested that we are doing all this extra materials characterization, materials analysis, and we are doing something new. We are trying to figure out why one material is better, why one material is worse, why one battery is better, why one battery is worse. So this got student also interested, and then industry also learned something new about the material that this is the this is the property they should try to address. This is the property they should try to fix if they want to uh, compete with the commercially available material. This is the property they should be fixing. So this insight is insight they did not have. They had done this testing. They can get the performance testing done from anywhere. But this materials characterization, this materials analysis, this they they have to come to the academy to to get this kind of information. So which this which is very unique about this. Project. So, but the, so it this project was not at all easy to deal deal with. This was my first project that I worked on in the field of battery with industry and I did not have any lab equipment at the time. There was no battery fabrication, battery characterization facility at the time. So what we started out with, we started out with materials testing. We had that material, we did some material testing, materials characterization using the, uh, the central facilities that we have at IDEA. And then we used, it, used all this time while we we're doing the material testing to set up the lab and to train the team. To get the team to get the team up to speed, and then in the meantime, we were also discussing. We were, we were having monthly meetings with the industry. We were giving them updates that within three four months we'll have our lab set up, we'll have our lab ready, and then they will have all the data they need from the batteries. So, so these are the to to meet with the challenges uh, related to this project. I think we are. Uh, Getting close to uh, the end of the talk, is that correct, or do I still have some time? Yeah, I, I think you can go a little. Okay, okay, we still have some time, and and I have few slides to cover, so we continue. So uh, then the so the same company GFL, they were so impressed with the the kind of uh, my kind of deliverables we had from the project uh, that they. Extended our funding by three, four months. So they had uh, 
they gave us another medium that they wanted to test us. <laughs> they wanted us to test, and they also wanted to work on work with us on uh, another uh, new uh, battery uh, component that they are, they are coming. They are they are going to make is electrolyte. So you could have seen this article in the news recently that Vidra Chemicals is is now incorporating an EV subsidiary, which is only going to work on materials required for battery fabrication, right, for electric vehicles. So Rujas Flow Chemicals is not only going to keep making binders, they are going to make they are going to make electrode components also, which is very good news, at least for me, because now I get to test their other materials also. And they are so impressed by the kind of uh, uh, kind of deliverables that we have, uh, kind of performance we had, in our uh, previous project that they are giving to that they are willing to give this project to us also, which is on electrolyte testing. So we had a, I gave them a presentation which was basically summarizing what all testing will do for them, and and they are going to then they are they promised us that they will continue funding the project to us and they will get this extend the timeline of the project and then they will do this electrolyte testing also with us. <laughs> 